Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Goulder, contributing editor with Tax Notes. Welcome to the April edition of In the Pages, where we take a closer look at some of the recent content from our print and online publications. Well, this month, we've done something a little bit different. We actually have two featured articles that we're going to profile. And the subject matter will be something that's very familiar to you. In fact, you see it every day on the news. We're looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, should the package of uh, U.S. economic sanctions extend to tax policy? Specifically, should the Biden administration terminate uh, the U.S.-Russia tax treaty? Well, interesting question. There's certainly uh, a lot there to consider, including the impact on taxpayers who've presumably done nothing wrong. Uh, to help us sort through all this, we have some exceptional authors. Uh, first, we'll be talking to David Morse, Tax Policy Director with the Coalition for a Prosperous America. Uh, his piece is titled, Going Beyond a Simple Treaty Withdrawal. Later in the segment, we'll be joined by Martin A. Sullivan, economics contributor to Tax Notes. His piece asks the question, can Cypriot conduit companies provide treaty benefits to Russians? Uh, interesting, because there are going to be issues there about the LOB provisions we're going to have to look at. So uh, with that in mind, let's get started. David Morris, welcome to In the Pages. Thank you very much, Robert. Now, here's the thing. Um, the readers of tax notes are going to think that tax treaties are pretty important things. And so do big corporate multinationals who rely on them. They can reduce withholding taxes. They can relieve double taxation. And we like to think in our little world, these are really important things. But something tells me that the Russian dictator, Vladimir Putin, just doesn't care about tax treaties. Um, with that in mind, what is the, the argument? which you've raised in your piece, uh, for terminating this treaty. If it's not going to deter Putin's aggression, why do it? Right. Well, once again, thank you for having me on. I, you know, I have to agree with you. It's not going to affect Putin. I mean, if you look at what he's been willing to sacrifice for a military victory and the amount of unfortunate and horrific death on the part of Ukrainian civilians, uh, to think that a simple track tax treaty withdrawal will even blip on his radar is incredible. You know, I just don't think that it's um, it's something that we can think will have an effect. But that doesn't mean that we have to fund Putin's war. And what I mean by that is, you're absolutely right, and you explained it. Tax treaties smooth the system. They they make trade and financial transactions easier between the two countries, and uh, you know. But in my opinion, it's it's like a trade benefit and certain trade benefits don't need to stay around when you have an aggressor, an, a nation that invades an ally, destabilizes a region and commits atrocities. So if you look at it, you're actually looking first at the idea that you're signaling the rest of the world. You're telling them we do not accept this. Even if we have a pre-existing agreement, there is something that we expect out of you out of that agreement. There was a, there was a promise, it's implicit, but in the US-Russia treaty uh, on tax, the promise was that Russia would be a peaceful partner in the global economy. I mean, we encouraged production in Russia by American companies to produce goods that ended up getting sold back to the United States. Now, I have my own issues regarding that considering reshoring, but we thought that would be enough to check the authoritarian tendencies. Obviously we were wrong and now we have to deal with those consequences. But if you even go beyond that symbolism, as the end of the treaty comes around, the tax benefits on US source dividends and related party interests end for Russians. Now, when you think about who is actually investing in our country, the these are probably the kleptocrats. They're the most likely beneficiaries of these benefits as they currently stand. Uh, we're not talking about the Russian middle class mostly, and that's actually a rare thing for economic sanctions. Many times, unless you specifically target and name a person, the generalized economic sanctions many times hit the everyday Russian person. So geopolitically, I think this is a wise policy. Uh, it means less money flowing into the upper echelons of the Russian government, and I think that's a good thing. You've made that case very well. Now, the title 
uh, of, of your article, though, is going beyond a mere treaty withdrawal, which brings up the issue of, well, what else can we do? And there are these foreign tax credits out there. Uh, readers of tax notes will be pretty familiar with how foreign tax rules work. Uh, the question there is, should they be denied if a, if a U.S. taxpayer, a, a business, say, has paid Russian taxes, can they claim that as a credit against the U.S. tax liability? Some say that resembles an economic subsidy, and you have to be careful who you're subsidizing. So, so what do you say? Um, is it worth looking at disallowing foreign tax credits? I think it is. Um, I mean, I know most of uh, the viewers will know what a foreign tax credit is, but I want to go back to what the purposes are of a foreign tax credit, um, just in the more simplistic sense that they both serve the larger concepts of free trade. The first being to avoid double taxation uh, that results when a US worldwide system could impose taxes on profits that were already taxed in another country. Uh, the second purpose is to smooth the system with the secondary country so that we are not going after the same base. We're effectively abdicating that tax base to them because we're trying to smooth the trade between the two. I, it is supposed to incentivize free trade and I was taught in my econ classes going way, way back that this would stop wars. Now, I think this fits into the ideas of the, what has the US done in the past regarding this? And the US did create the state sponsor of terror list um, that denies foreign tax credits to specific nations under, I believe it's the IRS code 901J. Uh, this is a very specific list that has additional consequences and it exists for an era when we thought direct nation to nation battles and wars would be relatively rare. And we were more interested in international terrorism um, and the countries that would support international terrorism rather than going head on into war. Uh, it, effect, it effectively denies those countries the funds uh, from the United States through foreign tax credits. Because once again, like you said, there's this concept that we're effectively subsidizing them when we do that. So if they are an enemy, we don't wanna be doing that. And while the terrorism concern, I don't think has gone away, it's now, we're, we've now become hyper aware that direct nation to nation war is not only possible, it could become prevalent, and even worse, that uh, it always directly impacts the United States because we're so involved all around the world. I would point out that uh, Senators Wyden and Senator Portman, uh, they proposed draft legislation that denies the tax credits and deductions to companies that continue to operate in Russia and Belarus. Uh, these would be foreign tax credits and the ability to use uh, those taxes paid also in the guilty calculations, the uh, global intangible low tax income. And so I do think that we're subsidizing Russia when we provide those foreign tax credits. And normally that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they were play, uh, playing by the regular rules, but I think that they've abandoned it and we've been abandoning the tax base to them. It's time to change that. I will also say that something that I noticed in the legislation was that they were very clear that they were distinguishing it was a special rule for Belarus and for Russia. This was gonna be a special rule. And I think that's the right call. I think it's important that they're not labeled state sponsors of terror because that's a different terminology and I don't want it to be confused. Now, I personally think that we need a new category so that we're alerting the world that we are paying attention. And I would use something along the lines of uh, invading and destabilizing nations as a category. But regardless of what you call it, this I think this is a step in the right direction. Well, personally, I happen to agree with you, but uh, I'll let you in on this story. I, I was having a conversation very similar to this with a respected colleague, and she made this comment to me. She said, well, you got to be careful about weaponizing uh tax policy uh after all if if we say that reducing double taxation is a is a good idea and that's should be in our tax treaties and it should be in our tax laws and, and sort of part of this international consensus don't we need to worry about um straying away from that concept if it's the right concept um 
then we have to worry about saying, well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, not being contextual, just being absolute. Um, so I don't know. My, my, my thinking on that is that we're talking about tax treaties and they're sort of inherently political. I mean, the current treaty that we've got between the Russia and U.S. goes back to the early 90s. It, it, it doesn't go back to the Soviet era. This was during the first President Bush uh, and while Boris Yeltsin was the leader of Russia and saying, hey, we want to have a new modern tax treaty with you to encourage trade. That, that's kind of like a carrot, right? You know? uh rewarding them for good behavior and trying to incentivize future good behavior well the flip side of a carrot is a stick so on one hand you have this idea that um uh the, the goals of, of of reducing double taxation are absolute and that we shouldn't weaponize them but i wanted to get your take on that right and i've also heard the theory that tax policy should remain agnostic um and I don't think it's uncommon uh, because the tax policy world, many of us are trying to find the most efficient way the, to gain revenue for the state while at the same time not impacting business activity. Uh, you know, prior trends, especially I think prior trends, aspire to stay above the freight and, and prioritize that avoiding that double taxation you mentioned, uh, almost no matter the consequences. Now, I'm going to have to admit that I do the same. Um, but I'm doing it on the tax fairness for domestic corporations. And I'm continuing the previous work by Reuven Aviona, Kim Klausing, and Bill Parks and sales factor apportionment. As professionals, we all start from the idea that we can create a better tax system for all seasons. But here's where the rubber hits the road. And I think that it's once you start thinking that tax can be perfect rather than perfected, you have a problem. You're forgetting that tax policy will always be imperfect because it's a human activity and human beings are frankly messy. Uh, and once you accept that it's a human activity, then it kind of becomes inhuman to accept war atrocities as the price of doing business, as the, uh, that the tax system must remain above such things. And I think the state sponsor of Terror List is a great example of using the stick. We've done it before. And we've used the tax trees as carrots in tax, and it's not only Russia. But I think right now, unfortunately, because we're not living that fear and that danger that our allies are facing, it's seductive to want to go to the cheap goods and ignore the pain that all these other countries are facing, not just Ukraine, but everybody who's worried that they're next. And I don't think that the tax system and free trade, the purpose wasn't to carve out American production or even just to get cheap stuff from overseas. I think those were byproducts. The core of the free trade argument, the one that I was always taught, was it's supposed to stop wars. Now, I've heard two sides on the, of that coin. From a pro-globalized perspective, you know, I understand the impulse to avoid weaponizing taxation. But that's in a short term theory. In the long term, I'd argue that if you truly believe that globalism has not failed and you think that the Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine is a outlier, you have to treat it like an outlier. You have to respond as if it's an outlier. And that includes additional discouragement for any others who would attempt military invasion and causing further damage to the concept of a peaceful global community. Now, doing nothing or calling for Ukraine surrender as I've seen a few people do, uh, that won't shore up the status of that globalist argument. To me, it detracts from it. Now, if you wanna believe that we're in the start of a post-global or regional or deglobalized era, you're talking about taking the same approach but you're doing it for a different reason. You embrace the tax policy that cannot remain agnostic because the real world events will affect it. And by not changing it until it's too late, you have a problem. You're accepting that the geopolitical policy does not always include the rational man when you're dealing with autocracies and tax policy should respond accordingly. I'm going to completely admit I'm in the second camp, but I was taught and believed the first for a long time. So I see both sides of it, but we have weaponized tax before 
And the only difference this time is that we're talking about a larger trading partner that we invested time and money into for decades. And unfortunately, I think we're going to have to listen to Kenny Rogers, the gambler, when we when he says, yeah, no, I have to, when you have to know when to fold them and you have to know when to run away and walk away, especially from a bad hand, no matter how big that pot looks. Very well said. Now, one of the things you mentioned in your article is that uh, last year, Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Corporate Transparency Act. And I'm reminded of that in the context of the Russia-Ukraine situation, because we always hear about Putin uh, and perhaps other kleptocracies around the world taking advantages of anonymous shell companies in sort of the murkier corners of the global economic system. If you could work us through here, what did that legislation accomplish? Uh, and did it go far enough in your eyes? Right. So. I'm kind of glad that you mentioned other kleptocracies as well, because yes, the Russian kleptocracy isn't my only concern. They're just the problem at hand. They're emblematic of the consequences when we foster a system rooted in secrecy. So thinking long-term, we have many foreign interests investing and de facto controlling US property and interests. Our over-reliance on secrecy encourages the investment that may harm our national security interests in my mind. So. I think it's clear I like cutting past uh, traditional procedures if I feel they hamper our national interests, which is why I reference the FACT Coalition and why I find their perspective so enticing. So we need to know where the foreign interests might wield power over us and entrench their own potential problematic methods of power through completely anonymous U.S. investments. Anytime a financial investment is made in the U.S., that's the power to influence because there's always the threat, that threat that the foreign investor might take that money away and it can entrench and grow a potentially adversarial power as we're seeing via the Russian oligarchs in real time shocks to the US financial and governance systems. So you mentioned the Corporate Transparency Act. Early last year, it was passed as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. And this legislation, thankfully, effectively banned anonymous shell companies. But the problem in any law is always funding the enforcement, the efficiency of the agency, and the exceptions. The agency that needs to create all the needed rules and enforcement, it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, known as FinCEN. And it's not gotten the needed funding it needs to do. So that's led to delays and time for the Russian kleptocrats to continue to benefit. We know that set of, a set of proposed rules is currently in the works, and we're hopeful that final rules will come by the fall, but you, know, you have to wait and see how long everything takes. The exception to the Corporate Transparency Act includes private investment funds, um, many private equity funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, and they're completely outside of any money laundering regime and certain operating businesses that don't otherwise report beneficial ownership on information, and many trusts or common law partnerships. So we have weaknesses that we left with the anti-money laundering accounts, even for real property reporting. So I think that's a problem because some US states, you know, I, I don't blame them. They saw the benefits of providing secrecy to gain foreign investment assets and said, why, why should the foreign tax havens have all the fun? They created laws that benefit secrecy. I, you know, once we don't deal with it, internationally, we still have the problem. So, but we still have this lack of knowledge and it impacts our national security. Uh, we can't have foreign investment interests without a clear picture of who has influence. So the strongest way that I saw provided was to register this information and have clear due diligence obligations for the professionals that's talking accountants, lawyers, trustees, formation agents, art dealers, and many others who should be asked and made to register the beneficial ownership. So we're talking about closing these loopholes and the Corporate Transparency Act has to be made timely, strongly stood up. And I would say that this, this, there are gonna be people that oppose it. Everyone who benefits from secrecy, um, many professionals advertise or rely on word of mouth that in fact, uh, you can trust our discretion. But the problem is I'm afraid they're trading on a privilege that the US can no longer afford. I think that some very wealthy US investors might also rely on this discretion and they would not be happy to lose it. And while we could initially limit the reporting to foreign interests, 
we would also be creating a significant incentive for a black market of unofficial American straw men investing on behalf of foreign agents. So for that reason, I think it's preferable to fully apply the due diligence requirement. And then many of these foreign investments will be dealt with, especially the ones that are bound back to authoritarian structures of their home country and our free market system should not be subservient to those. I think your point about the uh, cottage industry of American straw men is a, is a very good one there. So thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, last question for you before we move on. Uh, right now today, if you had President Biden's ear, uh, what would you tell him uh, about countering Putin's aggression in terms of tax policy? One thought. My temptation here is to immediately run to sales factor apportionment and argue that taxation on pure destination-based territorial system would remove all, most of the underlying issues for tax policy. Realistically, uh, Ukraine is not a problem that will be resolved with just one tax or trade policy. I'm not sure Russia is ready for a prolonged NATO war, but I will admit I'm worried the U.S. isn't ready either. Ukraine needs a strong United States and a strong NATO to keep them armed and to help the Ukra Ukrainian refugees supplied, fed, housed. So I think I'd start with, um, Mr. President, you, you campaigned on Build Back Better. You realized there was inherent weakness in our capabilities and COVID proved you right with the brittle supply chains. Please prioritize a return to the arsenal of democracy, tax policy, trade policy, and economic policy that prioritizes domestic companies and domestic production. Arsenals are not just weapons, they're also the support structures for food, supplies, and the supply chains for critical resources. Right now, we do have inherent weaknesses. If we were cut off from critical resources, we'd have to prioritize ourselves over Ukraine. Now, that would be my statement. I think the administration actually sees these issues. I think they're actually working on them. But they also, I think they're also trying to result to half measures to not jolt the system. But if a recession is coming, like people are predicting, and higher domestic production with a purpose can only be a good thing for that. And increasing American production to provide you for Ukraine seems like a strategic and beneficial investment to me. So I'd advise them and the rest of Congress to emphasize and speed up reshoring of critical supply chains, especially from potential adversaries. There you have it. The author is David Morris, Tax Policy Director of the Coalition for Prosperous America. The article is titled Going Beyond a Simple Tax Treaty Withdrawal, and you can find it in the Tax Notes archive. David, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Moving on now to the second of our featured articles for the month, I am joined by economics contributor Marty Sullivan, a, a very familiar face to people who uh, watch the show and, and read tax notes. Marty, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. So, Marty, all this news about Russia and Ukraine, depressing. Oh, my God. Buildings blowing up, families being destroyed, murder, mayhem. It's terrible stuff. And what can we do? You know, terminate the treaty, right? But the first time I ever mentioned that to somebody, they, they shook their head and they're like, Bob, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it, Bob. It's not going to do any good because the Russians have conduit entities and they'll go through some other nation, uh, maybe a nation that's a member of the EU, maybe a nation with, with a, a U.S. tax treaty, who knows, but they'll use conduit, shell companies in other countries, and terminating the treaty with Russia won't do any good. Now, you sat down and you did some research, you crunched some numbers, as you so typically do, and the, one of the things I love about your tax notes articles is that I tend to be a, a visual learner, and you presented us with a figure one and figure two, folks at home listening, if you've got the article, you know exactly what I'm talking about, there's something that stands out on those charts. Uh, what is it? What did you discover when you scrutinized the data? Well, before I get to the boring numbers, uh, you just reminded me of something about talking. I really don't know a lot about treaties. And so I just sort of asked around. And when I'm looking for wisdom, I go to the, one of the great sources is, is our founder, Tom Field. And I said, Tom, what do you think about doing uh, curtailing the treaty? And I forgot that his lovely wife, Marcia Field, was at Treasury and she actually helped negotiate the uh, Russia Treaty. So, and the first thing that Marcia said was, ain't gonna stop Putin for one darn second. And I think we all, we all knew that, we all sort of know that. Um, so anyway, I thought that was a little fun color commentary to add in there. Now to the boring numbers. Um, 
let, let me just say uh, as, as, as background, as an economist, when we look at foreign investment, when we look at cross-border investment flows, there's two types. There's the real stuff, like when I go and invest in a business in Canada, and then there's what economists call the phantom stuff, where I'm just kind of investing in a shell company that's investing in another shell company that may be investing somewhere else. And um, in most countries, uh, you have a lot of, uh, you see a lot of inbound real investment and maybe a little bit of shell company activity. But for, but for some of these haven-like uh, uh, jurisdictions, it can be very large. And um, uh, for some uh, unpublished yet, um, for some research that I'm doing right now, compared the GDP of countries to the inbound foreign direct investment, and something like 50% would be a lot. Um, for Cyprus, it is not 50%, is not 100%, it is 20 times, two, I don't know, 20, uh, 2,000 uh, percent. Uh, what that means is that most of the investment that is coming into Cyprus is not real, that is uh, somebody investing in a real business, but it's folks investing in shell companies, conduit companies that is going somewhere else. Um, so, then what we looked at, we said, for this, it, what you're pointing to in the article, which just, it floored me when I saw it, because the, what the data show, and this was actually originally from Russia's central bank has this data, um, one half of all the investment uh, out of Russia goes into Cyprus. Now, Cyprus, by way of background, is about two thirds the size of Connecticut, has a population of about 1 million, you know, it's not a large economy. It would be like the United States, one, one half of all investment uh, by the United States was, would take place in Trinidad. And so you go like, well, that doesn't sound exactly right to me. And of course it isn't exactly right. And what it's telling us is two things. One is that the Cyprus economy and the Russian economies are very intermingled. You can't really talk about one without acknowledging the other. And the second thing is a lot of it is just conduit, not real activity. So uh, that was a real eye opener um, for me. Uh, I read, I must've read 50, you know, posts on the internet about, oh, uh, Cyprus is Moscow on the Mediterranean and the two, um, the two economies are intermingled. But until I saw the data, <laughs> it, it didn't really hit home. And uh, it's just, it's just absolutely uh, incredible. Well, why Cyprus? That's my next question. Why Cyprus? Mm -hmm. it, does it have uh, uh, strange tax rules, banking rules? Does it have a light touch in terms of its regulatory uh, involvement? You can <laughs> say that about a lot of countries, but, but is there something about like a debtor-creditor relationship, something where Russia got their hooks into Cyprus and Cyprus became dependent and just fell into their sphere of influence. Well, Bob, I can't I can't answer your question why Cyprus, but I can I can give you some background, in the, uh, which is um, Cyprus used to be a dependency of the UK, and in 1960 it became independent. And it was uh, if you take a look at the map of the Mediterranean when you have nothing else to do. Cyprus is all the way on the eastern side, close to Syria. Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, it must be, an, it, well, all the photos, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, so that, that's one thing. To keep. So in 1960, they gained their independence. They're agricultural. They're not very well developed. Well, in the, as you know, in the, when the wall came down, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, I believe. Um, well, uh, the uh, Soviet Union came apart uh, into the Russian Federation, and that's when the Russians, you remember that old movie, The Russians Are Coming? That's when the Russians came uh, to Cyprus with lots of money, buying real estate, buying yachts, buying, in some cases, buying citizenship. And it really transformed that little Cyprus economy from maybe an agrarian, uh, tourism, shipping uh, into more of a financial hub. Um, and so, um, it, and then, what even made it even more attractive was in 2004, Cyprus became part of the EU. In 2008, it adopted the Euro. 
And don't forget that uh, they used to be a British, um, so they use, they use British law. And apparently from some sources that I'm reading, what really attracts Russians to Cyprus is that law, which gives them property rights that they may not have, certainly do not enjoy in Russia and even in other jurisdictions. So, uh, and you mentioned the light touch. Of course, Cyprus has a very low tax rate, has very favorable uh, tax and regulatory rules. It has a not undeserved reputation of being a little bit dicey when it comes to uh, some of the rules and regulations. Um, uh, and also, um, you know, the whole, the whole environment there. Oh, the other thing is, um, you know, it's uh, sort of what like Naples, Florida is to a Minnesotan. I imagine Russians really enjoy living uh, in, uh, in Cyprus. There are an estimated 40,000 Russian uh, residents in, uh, in Cyprus. That's a lot. That's a lot. So they like the sunshine and they like the, um, the environment for owning property and having property rights that they might not have back home. Now, when we talk about tax treaties, you've noticed in your article that there was a speech Putin gave back, I think it was in March 2020, about updating the Russian um, treaty policy, not their yeah. model treaty policy per se, but he sort of gave what sounded like an ultimatum to people to saying, hey, we're going to make some changes here. And if you don't go with it, we're just going to terminate the treaty. And then we read at the beginning of this year, OK, January 2022, that the Netherlands Russia treaty is just terminated and not by the Dutch, by the Russians, with the implication being that the Dutch looked at this ultimatum and said, no, we're not going to play your game. We're, 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 we're going to walk. We're not, we're not going to go for that. Um, right. And by the way, that was pre-invasion. Yes. Termination. So go ahead. All right. Uh, so what was going on there? What were the demands that <laughs> Putin was making? Uh, it was about withholding taxes. Is that what well, it was? First of all, he made the speech uh, about two years ago uh, on national television. And, you know, to hear some, to hear, you know, it would be like, Imagine Joe Biden came out and started talking about tax treaties on national television. You go like, really? Since when? You know, uh, so that was the first thing that was striking to me. But it shows you how important it is to the Russian economy to have uh, all this foreign investment. OK, um, what was going on? It was 2000. It was right in the midst of the covid crisis, which is, of course, still going on. But uh, and they were short of cash and um, the withholding rate on dividends coming out of Russia was 5%. Well, if you, under the treaties, all the treaties that they had. Well, if you got rid of that treaty, uh, the, uh, or you renegotiated that treaty, you could get a 15% rate. And he needed, they needed the money. They were short of cash. This is pre-invasion. They needed the money. So they said, uh, hey, folks, for all the dividends that are coming out of Russia, we, want, we don't want 5% anymore. We want 15%. And if you don't do it, we're just going to terminate the whole treaty which creates havoc, uh, depending on, in every different country, it would be a different type of havoc because they have different domestic laws that will take over and so forth. But right now, let's just call it havoc. And um, what's another interesting point about that is that, um, uh, you know, we're talking about abrogating no, our treaty with Russia. Well, he's, he's abrogating his treaties. You know, who's, you know it's, like, uh, it's like the oil and gas should we stop? Should we stop buying it? Well, he might stop selling it. You know, which you know, uh, there's two sides to this coin. Um, and then to go back to uh, Netherlands, which is a very big country when it comes to foreign investment, as our as our listeners know, um, the Dutch just said we're not going to do it, and uh, Putin abrogated the treaty. And um, the three treaties that he did renegotiate, at least you know, these are this is ongoing stuff, so I, it might not be perfectly up to date, but he, uh, he um, renegotiated the withholding rate, raised the withholding rate for Cyprus, Malta, and Luxembourg, those kind of tax and tax haven places. And he's going down the list. He's going to Switzerland, and I can't remember where else uh, next. So um, treaties are important. They're in play. They were in play before this all started. And um, it's uh, every time I start looking at this stuff, instead of getting beginning a better understanding, I get more questions. Treaties are very complicated 
law. And by the way, they are law. They're not just handshakes. They're, as, as you know, Bob, they are <laughs> just like Congress passing a law when, when the Senate approves a treaty, you can't just go snap your fingers and go, I don't feel like doing that anymore. You have to pass another law or abrogate the treaty. Well, treaties are complicated. And one of the more complicated provisions has got to be the LOB, Limitation on Benefits uh, provision. And this is important stuff because when you think about it, you know, two contracting states, they want all of the, the, the benefits of that treaty to go only to the residents of that state. They don't want those treaty benefits to be available to the whole wide world. Right. Let's, so let's, ex let's explain. Yeah. To folks please. who don't live in breathe this every minute of the day it's the abuse is called treaty shopping what does that mean okay so i'm a dude i'm in country c okay i want to invest in country a because that's that's where the gold is um but country my country c doesn't have a treaty with country a hmm what should i do well i'm going to shop around quote unquote shop look for a treaty between country, a country like country B and A, and then I'm going to pretend to be a resident of country B or somehow make myself eligible for the treaty benefits of country B. So that's treaty shopping. And then to stop treaty shopping, you have LOB. Don't use acronyms, Bob. <laughs> Limitations of benefit clause, which try to prevent mo uh, people like me from using that country B treaty to get treaty benefits. The reason why that came up was the US Cyprus treaty is an old treaty. It's, it's 1984. Uh, it was uh, negotiated, it was ratified in, no, it was approved by the Senate in 1985 and it came into force in 1986. We were all preoccupied with the passage of the 1986 act. So, I don't really remember that at the time, but the, um, anyway, um, back then Cyprus um, had, it now has a corporate rate of 12.5%. Back then the rate was 42.5%. Back then Cyprus uh, didn't have all these Russians and all their money in there. Back then um, it wasn't part of the EU. It didn't have the Euro. It was an entirely different situation. And more importantly than all of that, back then, the, um, our treaty policies, I understand it, and I'm just an amateur in this, but our treaty policy has totally evolved to make, to have tougher limitation of benefit provisions. And so the limitation of benefit provisions that is, that is in the US Cyprus treaty is kind of shaky. Not good. It's an old fashioned one that the Treasury, not my opinion, the Treasury, it doesn't negotiate or uh, uh, implement uh, include in their new treaties this type of uh, lenient limitation of benefit provision. So um, and it's called the uh, business purpose uh, provision, which is a subjective test. And what that says is if a guy like me wants to use um, country B. I can just say, well, I have a real business purpose for being in B, even though I live in C. I, uh, so, and the, well, what does that mean? Well, you know what it means? It could mean almost anything. You can read some court cases and uh, it's mind numbing, teeth chattering, you know, just, ter you know, uh, splitting of, uh, of hairs about what this business purpose test is. It's very subjective. Um, it's, um, looks like something you can get around. Or to put it in the other, put it differently, let's say I am a legitimate business person and I want to invest, I am investing in B. Uh, so I, I, I am using the B, the treaty, so I can invest in A. Well, I can't even be sure that's going to work because I don't know how the IRS is going to rule on that and how the courts ultimately might rule on that. So let's just get rid of that. Let's have more objective types of standards to establish residency in, and pre to prevent uh, treaty shopping. So that was a big red flag for me going, uh oh, maybe I got a really big story here because there's like this big loophole in the Cyprus treaty that even if, um, you know, we abrogated the Russia treaty, they're just going to use Cyprus. But it turns out that's probably not, wouldn't happen. Okay. So 
as of now, when the U.S. negotiates a treaty, it's not using that old archaic uh, uh, limitation of benefits provision. We've, we've got better rules now. How do we get this better rule into an updated treaty with Cyprus? It takes two to tango, right? They'd have to agree to that. And there are other roadblocks. I mean, getting, getting a treaty ratified, first getting it through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, not as easy as it was once upon a time. Are you talking about a certain junior senator from Kentucky? I might be. Who uh, ran Paul. Um, so that's one, let's start at the end. One big obstacle uh, until two years ago, and it's still an obstacle, but at least the dam broke a little bit, is that Senator Paul, Paul was blocking all of the negotiated tax treaties uh, that went through the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and so they couldn't get a vote on the Senate floor. You need two thirds of the Senate to approve a treaty. And under these ancient Senate rules, he can put a hold on that. And basically one Senator can just say no. And his concern was about giving, providing information about US citizens to foreign governments would be a sort of um, uh, in, uh, imposition on the secrecy or privacy rights of US citizens. Um, on the flip side, U.S. businesses were really ticked off because they really like uh, treaties. So, um, uh, but it, I think it was a couple of years ago, they approved, McConnell did some maneuver, I still can't figure out what it is, but basically uh, caught um, his uh, fellow Kentuckian uh, and got three or four treaties approved. But note, there's still, uh, the, for example, the Hungary Treaty, which was negotiated like, I don't know, 10, over, over 10 years ago, is still hanging out there in limbo. And that's no small thing because the Hungary Treaty, like the Cyprus Treaty, is an old treaty that needs to be updated um, because it doesn't, real, doesn't have a good limitation of benefits provisions. So even if we shut, let's say Cyprus was a problem, and so we shut it down, like you say, why Cyprus? Well, Let's just go to Hungary. You know, what's the, uh, we'll just do some treaty shopping through Hungary, which is actually even weaker in its uh, provisions than, um, um, than Cyprus. So, but, but here's the thing. It's like, you feel like you're chasing your tail. The, um, well, you say, what should we do? Well, what we should do is not, the, it's already done. We just have to get Rand Paul out of the way and pass the treaty that we've already negotiated 11 years ago. So, you know, the, it's just totally a crazy situation. We've already done it. So, and we need to update all of these treaties, but negotiating it, then you talk about, again, we're working backwards. We have Rand Paul, we have treaties that are on the, um, you know, in the inbox, so to speak. And then we have to renegotiate a treaty. And that's just, you know, it's a, it's a bilateral negotiation. Everything's on the table. And so it's a very complicated process. Well, it almost sounds like you're describing a game of whack-a-mole. We, we, could, we could terminate the Russia Treaty and they'd go to Cyprus. We could act on the Cyprus Treaty and they might go to Hungary. And I'm guessing, thinking ahead, projecting, if you did something about uh, the, the Hungary Treaty, they'd find even a fourth country. So, so hard to make progress there, but you've done a very good job of describing that scenario. But uh, one thing, Bob, though, I do want to make clear is that it's, you're making it sound like it's almost, it's, it's not that easy to use these limitation of benefits uh, loopholes. Um, for example, if I, let's say we, we shut down Russia treaty. Now all the Russians go, well, I'm gonna to go to Cyprus, okay? Well, you would have to indicate on your tax return well, or, or, or um, whatever it is that uh, reduces the withholding. Uh, you'd have to say, oh, I changed. I changed, I changed my mind. I'm a, I was Russian, now I'm a Cypriot. Well, guess what? These days, post-invasion, that, that would raise red flags anyway, in any situation, because one is you're moving from a real country to a tax haven country. So the IRS is gonna scrutinize that very closely. And now the IRS, and it has a formally announced, is working closely with FinCEN to, you know, uh, to investigate anything to do with Russian, especially in, in suspicious situations. So it would be difficult uh, to, to, to do this. It would be difficult to do this before the invasion. It's even more difficult to do it now. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I don't know enough, but uh, it would, it's not something you would do and sleep, uh, uh, sleep soundly at night and not worry about. 
Understood, Marty. Running short on time. I got one final question for you, but I've said it's a doozy. I've saved the best one for last. Uh, I've left, listened to you so often talk about the virtues of neutrality in the tax system. This is kind of a gold standard. Don't favor this person. Don't favor that entity. Be neutral. Uh, and as an economist, you thinking about neutral in the context of, of the global tax system. Are, are there exceptions to that? Can neutrality be contextual? Because the question that I asked David Moritz when he had him on in the first segment is there's this whole pushback that you shouldn't weaponize double taxation or you shouldn't uh, weaponize tax policy generally. And, and I want to make the point, I think this stuff is political to begin with. I think it's all about carrots and sticks. And I run into economists saying, no, 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 we have to have neutrality. Let me turn it back to you. Dish on me here. What, what, what's going on? A few quick points. First of all, all taxes are political, right? Now, I would love to have a perfect neutrally tax system as an economist, but uh, uh, five minutes on Capitol Hill will cure you of, of that uh, fantasy. The... Um, in this environment, we're talking about not just politics, we're talking about um, foreign relations. And the decision on whether to take these steps is a foreign relations decision, which is not my, uh, certainly not my expertise. All we can do in the tax world is inform the, who should be the real policymakers about what the implications of this would be. And, um, you know, Russia is not the first country to invade another country uh, in our lifetimes. Um, in, in fact, um, Turkey invaded Cyprus, 1974, no sanctions, no treaty abrogation or anything. Um, and then we have problems uh, with the, a lot of foreign countries that do very bad things. And so um, is, is this a special case? I don't even wanna to start to uh, address that, but we do need to understand the foreign policy implications much better. And as I think David was saying, you know, this might only be a symbolic gesture, but uh, symbolism can be very important. Uh, but I can't put a, as an economist, put a price tag on that. Uh, uh, so I, I, I won't try. There you have it. Stay tuned for more coverage of this issue in future editions of uh, Tax Notes, because it sounds like Marty's working on, on a sequel to this piece with more information <laughs> on the Cyprus situation. Uh, this piece is titled again, uh, Can Cypriot Conduit Companies Provide Treaty Benefits to Russians? And you'll find it in Tax Notes. Marty, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bob. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, and showrunner and video editor, Jordan Parrish. <laughs>